Hi, everyone. Welcome to the ICA's monthly speaker series, Navigating ICBPS Conversations with Experts. We are delighted that you are here with us today to learn from Christy Nineman, adjunct faculty member at Ohio University's Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine and an instructor in the Department of Psychology at Cleveland State University. She is also a PhD candidate at Case Western Reserve University and a member of ICA's Medical Advisory Council. Before we start, I have a few housekeeping items. Please note that this session will be recorded. If you are on camera, your video will be included in the recording. We will have a Q&A session following the presentation. To ask a question related to this topic throughout the session, please use the chat feature. Please feel free to direct chat with me, Jen Lean, for any questions you have that you would prefer to not share with the group. Once the Q&A session has started, you may also use the raise hand feature in Zoom. You will be asked to unmute yourself. If you aren't speaking, please be sure to stay muted. Christy will answer as many questions as she can during the webinar. And finally, please complete the post-webinar survey. A link to the survey has been posted in the chat. It's time to get started. Without further ado, please welcome Christy. Well, hi everyone. I am Christy and I am so very thankful and very grateful that you have all chosen to join us today. Um, thank you for coming to speak about this topic and learn about this topic. And as Jenlene said, I am definitely available to answer questions after I finish the presentation. But if something comes up for you while we are talking, Jenlene will be looking at the questions and kind of fielding things as I go through things um, so I can focus on content. So I'm gonna start off here by sharing my screen with you. It takes just a quick sec. All right. So Jenlene did a great job introducing me. I can, I can push through some of this pretty fast, but as she said, I have a master's degree in counseling. I earned that in 1999. And I have over a decade of experience working in crisis-based care and crisis intervention. In particular, I worked in emergency departments doing crisis psychiatric evaluations for individuals who were actively suicidal, individuals who had just attempted suicide, or individuals who were in other types of psychiatric crisis. So that's what I really focused my career on. I've also had experience working with the critical incident response team. And as a part of this team, what we did was crisis intervention with first responders. So this would be doctors, nurses, police officers. And as part of this program, I was also trained as a hostage negotiator and would respond with law enforcement to high value or high level risk scenarios. I've also worked for several years with a national suicide prevention organization. I do online, so text and chat suicide intervention with people who are having suicidal ideation. Um, given that I'm back in school and I left practice a while ago, this was something that I could do to stay um, connected and keep doing what's really important to me. But in all this work that I did starting in 1999, I realized I was seeing the same patients over and over again. Here I am in an emergency department. I'm trying to help people in crisis and they're continuing to remain in crisis or return to crisis. And I really wanted to do something to try and affect change in a different way. Our mental health system has some pretty serious problems. And so I came back to school to try and learn about that and try and make changes. In 2014, I earned my master's in public health. I have a degree, it's basically in epidemiology, it's population health research. And as, in Jen, as Jenlene said, um, I'm a PhD candidate in medical anthropology right now. So I've finished all of my coursework. And what I do, my dissertation is working with individuals with major depressive disorder or bipolar disorder who have what's called intractable depression. So depression that just has not responded to traditional treatments. And these are people receiving electroconvulsive therapy or ketamine therapy. And I talk with individuals at length about what works, what doesn't, what kind of help they need. And then I take this information and I feed it back up into psychiatry with the hope of really making change within the system and getting people, people what will help them best. I do teach, as Jenlene said. I love teaching at a medical school. I get to get to people early on and get them very oriented in terms of patient experience and patient care. And I teach in the Department of Psychology as well. 
and then I'm really happy to be a part of the ICA Medical Advisory Council. This is a new role for me. Um, it's something that I think is incredibly important, um, and I'm proud to say that one of my best friends is the president of the board, so that's how I became involved with the ICA. So what are we going to be talking about today? First off, we're going to start by talking about why it is so important to have conversations around suicidality and suicidal thinking. From there, I'm going to give you some really concrete guidance in terms of what to do when you're talking with someone that you think is at risk for suicide, what are different things that you can say, and what kinds of interventions or help are available so that you can help an individual get what they need in those moments. And then I'm also gonna provide some resources at the end. I do wanna say, if any of you are experiencing suicidal ideation and at any point in this time during the talk, you're feeling at risk or you're feeling like you're needing immediate attention or care, I highly recommend calling or texting 988. We're very lucky in the United States to have this national crisis hotline. It is staffed by trained people. They know what they're doing. Oftentimes they are local to you, so they will have access to local resources. So 988 is a really wonderful resource. You can also go online and just Google 988, and that'll take you to where you can interface with individuals via chat, if that's a way that's more comfortable for you. So highly recommend them. And I wanted to include this quote. I really like this quote. This is by an author named Sam Dylan Finch. And Sam is an individual with a history of suicide attempts, but has also lost loved ones to suicide as well. And what Sam says is if you're struggling with your mental health, it's never too soon or too late to let someone know. And it's never ever too heavy, too messy, or too much to ask. If you are hurting, talk to someone. If someone is hurting and they're talking to you, listen to that person. And we're gonna talk about ways to be listening to that person. Real quick, so what is suicidality? What is suicidal ideation? Suicidality is kind of a term that encompasses everything when we're talking about suicide, anything in relationship to suicide. Suicidal ideation, these are thoughts of suicide and they really exist on a spectrum. There's a continuum in terms of thinking about suicide. On one end, we have no thoughts of suicide. We then move into what's called passive suicidal ideation. So passive suicidal ideation is when someone is thinking seriously about suicide, but they do not want to act on those thoughts. So they're not planning to actively harm themselves, but they want to die. These are individuals who will say things like, I don't wanna be alive anymore. I can't keep doing this. I can't go on. That is passive suicidal ideation. Active suicidal ideation, this occurs when someone actively wants to harm themselves. So they're having these thoughts and they want to act on them. They want to do something about these thoughts in a negative way. And these are individuals that will have urges to harm themselves. These are individuals that will have intention to end their lives. And these are individuals who might have a plan to commit suicide as well. So that's when someone is actively suicidal. So why do we need to normalize suicidal thinking and talking about suicide? It might sound strange to say we need to normalize suicidal thinking, but the fact of the matter is it is incredibly common. There is so much stigma, there is so much guilt, there is so much shame that individuals feel when they are thinking about suicide and it really keeps people from talking about it and reaching out to the help that they need and that they deserve. So if we can normalize this, that's incredibly important. And if we normalize talking about it, we can all have more skills to use if we do talk with someone who is experiencing these thoughts or these feelings. So it's very common. And I'm gonna give you some data here that'll kind of drive this point home. So right now, suicide is the 11th leading cause of death in the United States. This is a somewhat misleading statistic, however. Right now in the US, Suicide is the second leading cause of death for individuals who are aged 15 to 24. It's the third leading cause of death for individuals that are 25 to 34. We go back down to second leading cause when we're looking at 35 to 44. And then for older, we start getting into fifth and seventh leading causes of death. So this is, this is a big problem. Suicide is a very big problem. 
Suicide falls outside of the top 10 when we start looking at individuals that are elderly. That is also misleading because there are extremely high rates of suicide in elderly individuals. The reason that it drops down in terms of its ranking is because there's also a high incidence of things like stroke, cardiovascular disease, other lethal diseases, cancers, things of that nature. But suicide is a big problem in the elderly as well. So this is very, very common. When asked in a survey, have you thought about suicide over the past year? 5% of Americans will say yes. So one in 20 will say yes in the past year they've thought about suicide. But when you start looking at individuals who are experiencing pain and chronic pain disorders, the numbers just jump through the roof. And I know for individuals with ICBPS, pain is oftentimes one of the very cornerstones of the experience. Pain is something that people are pushing through every day and, and experiencing every day. So this pops individuals with ICBPS into a different risk category. A study just came out in 2024 and they were looking at individuals with chronic pain and they broke individuals into two groups. One is called medically explained pain and the other one is medically unexplained pain. So medically explained pain is exactly what it sounds like. Someone is able to say, yep, that's the cause of your pain. Here you go. We can treat it this way. Medically unexplained pain is when it's more ambiguous. And I know this is often the case for IC. People have some ideas about what's going on, but oftentimes it's not really known for a particular individual what is causing exactly the pain that they are experiencing. You're also dealing with issues with access to care and the amount of time that it takes for an individual to be diagnosed with IC. And so you have this longer extended period of medically unexplained pain. And what you can see here is for individuals with medically explained pain, suicide and suicidal ideation, I should say, sorry, suicidal ideation pops up to 18.7% of the population, of that population. Whereas individuals with medically unexplained pain, that number pops all the way up to 28.4%. So that is a huge, huge number. This is something that people are thinking about. In 2021, there was a Canadian study that was with women who were diagnosed with ICBPS. And in that study, when asked, have you thought about suicide in the past year? 31.1% of participants said yes. When they looked at those responses in combination with risk factors, so things that professionals might look at and say, hey, this puts people into a risk category, that number increased to 38%. So very, very high. And again, this is all within the past year. But again, another way to demonstrate that this is something that's so common and we need to normalize thinking about this and talking about this is for individuals with chronic pain, when they were asked if they experienced suicidal ideation in the past two weeks, one out of four endorsed that they had. So 25% of individuals had said, yes, I have been thinking about suicide in the past two weeks. It's a very, very serious problem and a very, very common problem. And people who are experiencing suicidal ideation often feel incredibly alone, remarkably alone. And you can see with these numbers, they're not. This is something that many people experience and struggle with. So why do we wanna be able to normalize talking about suicide as individuals who might be intervening with someone experiencing these thoughts? So 80% of the time, individuals who have intent to commit suicide, so they're planning to do this, they actively want to harm themselves, will give some form of sign or signal that can be picked up on. So vast majority of individuals will show something that if people know what to look for, someone might be able to grab that and, and hook onto it and intervene. I do want to say what this also means, though, is 20% of the time individuals will attempt suicide or might complete suicide without there being any warning, without there being any signs. For individuals who have had a loved one, a friend, um, anyone that they care about commit suicide, there's a lot of guilt that goes along with that. I had a friend commit suicide. And as someone who does this for a living, I just thought, why did this person not reach out to me? Why did this person not feel safe? 20% of the time, people don't reach out. 
So if you have lost someone, you are not to blame. It's not because you missed anything. But we do want to know 80% of the time, there are potentially things that are showing that we can, we can latch on to. So what are some of these things? So we're thinking about warning signs for suicide. These are things like individuals expressing feeling isolated, feeling like they're a burden. You would be better off without me. People would be better off without me. That's a comment worthy of concern. Um, an increase in anxiety, an increase in agitation. If someone just cannot be comfortable in their own skin and being, that is a sign to be worried about. People feeling trapped, people that are in this unbearable amount of pain and people who see life just not changing at any point. An increase in substance use. So substance use is a huge warning sign and risk factor for suicide. Substances lower our threshold in terms of our risk-taking behavior. We can think about it in terms of, I'm gonna go out and have a couple of drinks and loosen up and be more friendly. It will lower inhibitions to harm oneself. So if somebody is abusing substances, that puts them at a much higher risk for acting on those thoughts. You're gonna see things like changes in mood again, anger, rage, mood, stream, mood um, swings, sorry, hopelessness, changes in sleep, people who just aren't getting out of bed or people who aren't sleeping at all, people talking or posting about wanting to die. This is something that you see. This is something that is not uncommon, unfortunately, where people are expressing their hopelessness in sometimes the only way that they know how, and that's just posting about it. I'm not safe telling somebody. I don't feel safe telling somebody. So I'm going to just put it out in the ether and put it out here. Or individuals making plans for suicide. I wanted to share a few things that I've seen in my own practice that have been big warning signs for me. Um, individuals who develop a matter of fact attitude. So someone who is actively suicidal and is very low affect or has very low emotion attached to discussions of suicide. So someone who would say, yeah, I'm going to kill myself and this is how I'm going to do it. And I would have somebody say to me, you know, you can hospitalize me right now, but I'm still going to do it when I'm released. And if there was just no display of emotion, that always really scared me. Individuals making arrangements. And one that always really triggered things for me is if someone had been making arrangements for their pets. So oftentimes individuals have animals because they're a great source of comfort for us. And if somebody that you know loves their animals so much, but all of a sudden they're looking to give them away, or all of a sudden they're saying, I can't, I can't keep them. Can you watch them for the weekend? If someone's looking to get their pets somewhere safe, so if they die, it's okay, that's a huge warning sign. A big risk factor is history of attempts. Has this person attempted suicide in the past? If someone has attempted suicide in the past, they're much more likely to attempt again. It just puts people into a different risk category. So it's something to be aware of. And then for individuals who are experiencing chronic pain disorders and chronic medical conditions in general, but chronic pain, insomnia. If someone is no longer able to sleep because they are in such extreme levels of pain, our bodies are regulated by sleep. If we don't sleep, we are not okay. Within a matter of days, people can develop psychotic symptoms. So if someone's not sleeping, they're really gonna be thrown off their game. And that's a huge risk factor and a big warning sign. Pain catastrophizing. So this is a bit of a sticky subject. And I wanna say that I'm listing this without any kind of judgment attached to this behavior. Um, I think it can be very difficult when people put kind of a moral aspect on something. And I want you to know, please, I'm not doing that here. Pain catastrophizing is when you reach a point where pain seems like it's all there is. I will never be without pain. I will never be free of this. Pain is everything that my life is. That is pain catastrophizing. It becomes the defining feature of who someone is. People will move to passive coping. So instead of doing things like our active coping strategies, which can be things like writing or going for a walk or yoga or things of that nature, talking to friends, someone has just sat back and said, this is just how it's going to be. So it's like that matter of fact attitude but put towards their own well-being. This is just how I'm gonna feel, this is, this is just it. 
And then access to medications. So individuals with pain disorders also um, often have access to pain medications and pain medications that are lethal. Um, psychiatric medications can also be lethal. There's also over-the-counter medication that can be lethal. Um, but access to pain medications, that's a big, big concern for individuals that are having suicidal thinking for sure. So I'm including this and kind of framing the rest of our conversation around what's called the ALGE approach. And this is from an organization called Mental Health First Aid. And you can find them online at mentalhealthfirstaid.org. I am not associated with them. I am not a trainer with them. I just think this is a great way to kind of think through things. I like having a quick mnemonic to remember and go, oh yeah, what a whole lot. Um, so I wanted to share this with you. So for them, ALGE, it's assessing for risk or harm, um, sorry, risk of harm or suicide, listening non-judgmentally to a person, giving information and reassurance, encouraging professional help if needed, and encouraging self-help. And that self-help is those coping, um, it's those coping mechanisms I just mentioned. So we're gonna go through these and talk about how you as individuals who are supporting individuals um, can talk with people. So first, when you're talking with someone and they're expressing things that are making you concerned that they might be thinking about suicide, if they are talking about feeling overwhelmed at the end of their rope, everything is bad, you know, if, if, they're, if they're speaking in a way that you are worried about the potential that they're thinking to harm themselves, how you ask them about this is so much less important than if you ask. Okay, the very most important thing is that you ask, are you thinking about suicide? Now, I'm someone, and I will probably say this again as I'm talking because it's so true of who I am. I am someone who spends a lot of time about thinking, how do I say this? How do I say this in the right way? How do I say it in a way that's not offensive or doesn't sound strange? And that's that's just how my brain works. So I wanted to give you some tools today and just some quick things to reference in terms of how can you broach these subjects with individuals. So asking directly, it feels scary. It does feel scary. Um, but being direct is the best thing to be. You want to be direct in your questioning. So asking somebody, are you thinking of killing yourself? That's the best possible way to ask somebody, are you thinking of killing yourself? When you've been listening to someone and they're sharing all this stuff that's going on in their life, it's good to reflect and say, you know, I have been listening to you. I hear what you're saying. I want to make sure I'm understanding what you're telling me correctly. So I don't want to make any assumptions about what you're sharing. I want to make sure I understand correctly. Are you thinking about suicide? It's another way that you can broach this. Or, and I've used this frequently, with what you've shared, I'm concerned for your well-being and safety. Are you thinking of taking your own life? So something that's important here is I'm not saying, are you thinking about death? You don't want to ask about that. Are you thinking about hurting yourself. You want to avoid that language as well. I'll say very quickly, self-harm is very different than suicidal ideation or suicide intent. So we hear a lot about self-harm in terms of cutting behaviors, burning behaviors. Oftentimes individuals that are engaging in self-harm, as unusual as it sounds, it's a coping mechanism that people use to either feel emotion or release emotion, but there's no intent to end an individual's life. They're not trying to kill themselves. So if you ask someone, if you're thinking about harming yourself, you aren't necessarily getting at the heart of what's going on. So saying, are you thinking about taking your own life? Are you thinking of killing yourself? This is the best way to really head in and have this conversation. Now I did say how you ask is less important than if you ask, which is 100% true. I do wanna give a little insight in a way to avoid asking. And that would be saying something like, you're not thinking about suicide, are you? Because if you approach a subject like that, you're telling that person, it's not okay for you to be thinking like this. And I don't wanna know if you're thinking about this. You are automatically putting this judgment into the conversation. So avoiding, you're not thinking about this, are you? Things of that nature that are putting, you know, suicide is wrong. Why would you even think about that? Are you thinking about this? You want to move away from that. Simple is best. 
something that I think is so incredibly important, thus the bold face giant green slide, is whenever someone is sharing their mental health with you, whenever someone is being vulnerable with you, you want to thank them for being honest and you want to thank them for their vulnerability and sharing their experience. This is a really big deal if someone is willing to talk to you about this. There is so much shame that an individual feels when they are experiencing suicidal ideation. It is overwhelming. And so to be able to say to someone, I'm not okay, this is how I'm feeling, it's a huge deal. So saying to them, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this with me. I am really glad you're here and I am really glad you're talking to me about this. So that's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're present. I'm glad you're here in this world. And I'm glad you chose me to talk to about this. I'm here with you. I'm here to listen about this. But really thanking people, it's very important. And it's something that you can do as you continue on through the conversation as well. So this is a brief outline about how to tell whether or not um, the situation is urgent, how urgent it is, I should say. Um, any kind of suicidal thinking is, is a crisis but um, how urgent it is and, and what kind of action might need to be taken as you move forward. So the four areas that we really look at are plan, intent, means, and time frame. And so plan is whether or not this individual has a specific plan, they know what they're going to do to kill themselves. Intent is, do they wanna do it? You will have individuals that have a plan that do not have intent. So that changes the level of risk. Plan and intent, higher risk. If you add in means, so this is an individual that's planning to, let's say, end their life with a firearm. They intend to do it. They have a firearm present. That puts them into a higher level of risk. So you want to know about means. Do you actually have the pain medication? Do you have what you would be required? And then time frame. What we generally look at in mental health is 48 hours. So is someone planning to do this before their spouse comes home for work? Or once their children go to camp on Friday? You want that time frame because the more um, the more set it is and the closer it is, the higher level risk it is. So some people will say, I'm going to kill myself in this way. I've got the ability. I've got the means, but I'm going to do this if I don't graduate in three weeks. That gives you a bigger window for intervention. That gives you a wider range of options and, and ways to move forward. But so these are the four things we really think about. And one of the things I always want to know when I'm talking with somebody, especially if I'm not present with them, so if it is on the phone, if it is on the computer or text, is asking somebody, are you safe right now? So you want to establish that. And can you keep yourself safe while we talk? Will you let me know if this changes? So I have spoken with people who have had firearms. They've had plan, intent, and a firearm present with them while they are actively suicidal. And in those situations, and if you find yourself in those situations, what you want to think about is how do you get distance between that person and those means? So you wouldn't want to say to somebody, hey, can you put that firearm in a different room? You don't want them touching that thing. Get away from it. So can you go to a different room? If no, they can't go anywhere else. Can you cover it with a towel? It can be as simple as blocking out of vision what that mean is. And that can give you more wiggle room in terms of being able to talk with the individual and keep that individual safe and calm. Have you already done something to harm yourself? This is an important question to ask. Um, oftentimes, sorry, should, uh, oftentimes is, is a little bit of a hyperbolic statement, but individuals, um, there are individuals who will take an overdose and they will regret taking the overdose and they might make themselves vomit. And then you hear from them or an individual has overdosed and then they wake up the next day. If someone has done something to harm themselves, they need immediately immediate medical care, even if they have tried to make themselves throw up, even if they made themselves um, or they woke up the next day. These are individuals who may have taken something, ingested something that has a long-term lethal action on the body, like Tylenol is the big baddie. So individuals who overdose on Tylenol, if they don't seek medical care, if they do not get what is needed to counteract that overdose, um, they can go into multi-organ failure. And so there are things that if someone's done this and, and okay, you've already done something to harm yourself, you got to get to a hospital. That's a biggie. Um, but then again, thinking about plan, intent, means, and time frame, have you decided how you would kill yourself? Have you secured everything you need to follow your plan and what are those means? And then when are you thinking of killing yourself? 
So these are the questions that you want to have in your mind. These are the questions that you want to know. And it's absolutely 100% okay to say, I just need to get a sense of your safety right now. I just really want to understand what's going on. And so I'm going to ask you these questions, but I, I'm listening and I am here. I, I just need to know where you're at. So again, suicidal ideation happens on a continuum. This is the continuum. Passive suicidal ideation is generally low risk. So this is where people don't have an intent to harm themselves. Um, it can pop up to medium risk if someone has a history of suicide attempts. So that does make it more of a risk. Active suicidal ideation, again, is people who want to actively harm themselves. They're having thoughts of suicide and they want to act on those thoughts. Um, a couple of things that you can think about when talking with individuals. One is forward thinking. So this is if you are talking with a friend and you're able to talk with them about, hey, you know what, this thing is coming up in a couple of weeks. Weren't you looking forward to this? Or somebody will say, oh yeah, I've got a vacation coming up. And you know they're thinking about things that are coming up in the future. And that's always a really good sign if someone has this forward thinking. Impulse control. If you're talking with someone and you know that they have poor impulse control, that's going to put them into a higher level of risk again. So unfortunately, as I mentioned before, 20% of individuals who attempt or successfully suicide don't show any risk factors. That's impulsivity. So you always want to be worried about that. And then substance use, as I said before, you want to, you want to make sure the individual is not intoxicated and does not plan to be or have a substance use disorder. And then you move into imminent risk. So imminent, this is the word that's used within mental health circles. This would be a word that you would wanna use if you're speaking to someone because a person that you are with is in crisis to a point where you cannot keep them safe and they can't keep themselves safe. So, excuse me, this is a person who has a detailed plan, they have intent, they have means, and they have a time frame. If individuals have all four of those things, this is an imminent risk and action needs to be taken. Again, passive suicidal ideation. I just wanted to give you a quick example of things that you could say to those individuals. Um, I think it's always good to reinforce that you were listening and you heard when they said they weren't suicidal. You want to let them know, I heard you. I trust you. I heard when you said you're not thinking of killing yourself. I appreciate you being so open with me. Suicidal thinking can look different for different people. So I want to follow up and ask, are you having thoughts wishing you weren't alive? And asking that question will give that individual the opportunity to expand on those thoughts if they're having them. In the past few weeks, have you wished you were dead? Do you wish you didn't have to go on living? Individuals with passive suicidal ideation are still hurting deeply. This is a very, very dark place to be. Um, so it's, it's, still, it's still risky and it's still indicative of a lot of psychic pain. So then we want to listen empathetically and we want to offer support. And I wanted to be able to give you some examples of things that I use um, when listening and talking with people and, and ways that I get people to talk. One of the things I, I think that we can get stuck in is just asking question, asking question, asking question. And something that can be really good is making an empathetic reflective statement and then just letting that person talk some more and hear what they have to say. So often, and it's so natural in situations like this, we can end up wanting to solve the problem. We can offer solutions immediately. What are we gonna do? You want that person to have time and space to be able to share with you what's actually going on. So saying things like, you are worthy of support. I won't pretend to know what you can and can't carry. A broken body is not a broken person. This can be really powerful for somebody who's experiencing chronic pain or chronic illness. Being resilient can be exhausting. And how true is this? Many of us have been at points in our lives where, oh, I do not want to have to deal with all this stuff. And it is absolutely exhausting sometimes to push through and reflecting that back to someone can be really powerful. It sounds like you're in a really dark place. So that's something that's free of judgment and you're just acknowledging it. It sounds like you're really hurting. It sounds like you're in a really dark place. You're grappling with something extraordinary, something beyond the bounds of what many face and carry. It takes real strength to be this vulnerable 
and keep yourself alive when everything feels too big to bear. You are remarkably strong. Individuals who are experiencing suicidal ideation more than often feel very weak and feel very shamed. Um, I feel like they're giving up is something that people talk about a lot. You know, I am a weak person. I just can't handle this. This isn't, this isn't something that I can do. And saying to someone, you're here and you've gotten yourself to this point. You've been able to persevere and push through the amount of strength that that takes is amazing. So I know you don't feel strong right now, but I see an amazing amount of strength in you. I see how much strength you've had up to this point. I may not be able to understand exactly how you feel or know what to say, but I care about you and I want to help. So staying away from that, I understand language. Oftentimes we can't really understand what's going on with somebody. We we can't understand where they're at. But saying, you know, I'm not I'm not able to understand this, but I but I want to. Your experience is your own. I don't want to put my experience onto you. And I really want to know what's going on with you. And I care about you and I want to help. It's a big, big, powerful thing. So something else that's very helpful, you don't need to have an explanation for your feelings. Whatever they are, they are valid because they are yours. Something that you will hear suicidal people say a lot is, I shouldn't be feeling like this. I shouldn't feel this. And so denying themselves the feelings that they are having. So to really say, you don't, you don't have to have an explanation. It doesn't have to make sense. It just is. And so let's focus on that feeling and let's focus on getting, getting that addressed and helping you feel better. I think that there's a lot of power in being vulnerable with people, especially today we're talking really about talking with family and friends and loved ones. So we're not talking about a professional setting. When you're outside of a professional setting, being vulnerable and saying something like, this is really scary for me to hear. I can only imagine how scary it is for you to share and to experience. So you're reflecting back to them. Like I find this, if you just said, you know, I this is really scary for me to hear, that can shut somebody down. If you can attach to it, this is scary for me. So I can't even imagine how scary this is for you. It has got to be so frightening for you. Then you're empathizing with that individual. You're being vulnerable with that person. And there can be a lot of power in that. And then a question that I think is great all the time is how can I best support you? What do you need right now? How can I best support you? So those are all different ways that you can approach talking with an individual and having these statements that you say that then allows individuals space to talk. You want to be empathetic and give them an opportunity to continue to tell you what's going on. Things not to do, don't argue with a suicidal person. Don't ever say you've got so much to live for because at that moment in time, they don't see it. So that is not helpful. All that is, is a judgment. Your suicide will hurt your family. A lot of people feel like if they commit suicide, they're actually doing their fan, friends and family a favor. Um, so that is not helpful. Snap out of it. When has that ever been a helpful statement for anything in anyone's life? No. Um, don't act shocked. Um, it's okay to be like, you know, this, this is surprising to me. I'm a little caught off guard, but you don't want that reaction of like, oh my God, and fall apart emotionally. You gotta, you gotta stay present and be there for that individual. Something that can be really difficult is you really can't promise confidentiality or be sworn to secrecy. So oftentimes people will say, you know, I, I want to tell you something, but it needs to stay between us because this is something very vulnerable. And this is something really scary. And what I will say to people is, I can promise that what we're talking about is going to stay between you and me in the sense I'm not going to talk about it at my dinner table. I'm not going to talk about it with my friends or when I'm teaching. It's not going to go anywhere there. But if something's going on and a medical professional needs to be involved, absolutely, I'm going to have to contact somebody. I cannot guarantee to you that I'm only going to keep this right here in this moment. So that is important. Um, and then don't try to fix the person's problems. Something that's important to think about is in the moment when you're working with someone who, or you're talking with someone who's experiencing suicidal ideation, the nature of the problem itself isn't the biggest issue. It's the feeling that's resulting from those issues or from that problem itself. So you're gonna to wanna to be focusing on these feelings that someone is experiencing. All right, 
So what do you do next? You've been speaking with somebody, you have a sense of what kind of risk they're at and what's going on. It's about giving information and encouraging professional help if needed. So if you've talked with somebody and there's active suicidal ideation, action has to be taken. That's just the bottom line. Something has to be done. And it can be working together to come up with a plan or in some situations, contacting outside resources. But if somebody is telling you, I am thinking of killing myself and I am thinking of acting on this, something needs to happen. Something that's important to keep in mind is you wanna work collaboratively with the individual. And I like to say, do with, not to. So you wanna talk with that individual, sit with that individual and come up with a plan together. If necessary, help facilitate who's in your area, what's in your area, what are things that you can do? So safety planning. Safety planning is looking at what are the things that you can do to keep yourself safe? What are things that we can do to keep your suicidal ideation from progressing or from you acting on thoughts of harming yourself? And when you do this, you wanna think about what is gonna be done, who's gonna be doing it, and when is it going to happen? So having that same kind of plan and time frame that you think about when you're assessing for risk for suicide present in a safety plan as well. And I'm going to give you some resources that I really love for safety plans. So that'll be coming up. You'll have that. Um, something that's important too is asking who or what has been supportive in the past. I think there's a lot of power in saying who else in your life knows that you're feeling this way? Who else have you shared this with? and encouraging the individual to talk with other individuals that are close to them and important to them. And, and, and it's okay to be open. You know, you've modeled, you can talk with this person about this and it can be a good experience offering to talk with that person with them. Um, but who and what have been supportive in the past? What coping strategies have you used in the past? Some individuals can do pretty intensive active coping strategies. So I'm gonna go for a hike. I'm gonna start painting. I'm going to do yoga. Other individuals, it's, I'm going to watch TikTok videos for 15 minutes. Like something that is very low stakes, requires low energy, that can still be a very good coping mechanism because it's going to distract somebody. And that's what coping strategies are. You want to distract. And then you want to focus on what a person should do as opposed to what they shouldn't do. So what are the next steps that you want to take? You're not going to be telling somebody, well, you know, you don't want to be going to that pool party, da, 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 da. You know, instead, you're focusing on what can be done that's going to be proactive and helpful for you. So in terms of professional health, there are a variety of types of professional mental health available when talking with individuals who are suicidal um, or experiencing suicidal ideation yourself. So we've got crisis lines like 988. There are other crisis lines as well. Mental health providers in the community. Many urban areas have mobile crisis teams. So these are crisis teams that will come to an individual directly, which can be really nice. Hospitals, so emergency departments do have individuals who will talk to an individual in a psychiatric crisis or 911, and 911 does need to be used sometimes. So when you're talking with somebody, you want to encourage that individual to get professional help as soon as possible. That's passive suicidal ideation all the way up to imminent risk. These individuals are deserving of help, and so you want to let them know that. You want to encourage that really powerful thing to work with them to find what kind of like local resources are available. So if you don't have a provider already, who's available in your community? Is there a mobile crisis team? Let's look and see what's out there. If they've got insurance, let's look at your insurance and see maybe who providers might be in your area. Really working with that individual to help them find somebody, to help them find a mental health professional. This can also be in terms of crisis lines. Okay, let's talk about 988. Let's talk about um, the SAMHSA line, which I'm going to give you, um, you know, what are some other resources outside of being in front of somebody where they can talk with a professional? If they're reluctant, keep talking. Just keep talking. You are worth it. You are deserving of this support. I am worried for your safety and your health. You mean so much to me. I want you here. Let's do this together. I know it's a frightening thing to try and seek help, but I'm here with you. Let's do this. If they cannot stay safe, if this is someone who's saying, nope, nope, I got a plan, I've got means, I've got intent, 
I I'm, I just don't feel like I can stop myself from doing this. You need to contact a mental health professional. Ideally, you want to contact somebody that they're already working with, even like a PCP or a pain doc, someone that they're working with to let them know what's going on. But as we all know, it can be extremely hard to get in to see somebody, let alone get them on the phone. So oftentimes this, this doesn't work. Um, but you want to, you do want to contact a professional. And if you can't get a hold of a provider that they already work with, that's when you're starting to look at crisis services. That's when you're moving into that realm. You do not want to leave the person alone. If a person cannot keep themselves safe, stay with them until they are in a situation where they are going to be safe. If a person refuses to speak with a professional and they've got a plan and they've got means, what I highly recommend is contacting a crisis line on your own for guidance, calling and saying, this is what's happening right now. I don't know what to do. What would you recommend? And having a person in real time being able to talk you through what's happening because you are deserving of support in that scenario as well. Um, I will say that working on a crisis line, we frequently do get contacted by parents, by friends, by people saying, I'm worried about this person and I'm not sure what to do. So never hesitate to reach out and call a crisis line with this type of a question. Never, ever hesitate. I would also like to say just something to put out there. You know, the goal of crisis services is to keep an individual alive. It's to keep individuals safe. We do whatever we possibly can to come to a resolution where that individual gets to stay in their community, in their home, with friends, with something, as opposed to the hospital. Hospital is absolute last resort. That's when people are saying, I can't keep myself safe. I won't keep myself safe. I, you know, I just can't do this. That's when somebody is hospitalized. But oftentimes people are afraid to seek help because they're worried that they're going to be hospitalized. And that's a very low percentage of the outcome when interacting with especially crisis lines and mobile crisis teams. It's, it's a pretty low percentage. If an individual has a weapon, call 911. Calling 911 is a very difficult thing to do. But if a person has a weapon, their life is at risk. There's a life at stake here. And if you're present, it's your life as well. So get out of there and call 911. You want to let the police know that the individual does have a weapon. That's always really important. Um, that's to keep everyone safe. Thankfully, now most police departments have psychiatrically trained police providers. So they've got some have actual mental health providers on the force. Others, the police officers have received extensive mental health training. And so they're the ones that respond to psychiatric crisis. Um, so oftentimes someone with mental health training will respond to these types of calls. Um, but if a weapon is involved, that person is at such great risk, you don't mess around, you call 911 the end and you let the officers know there's a weapon. And as I said earlier, if they've already done something to harm themselves, you want to call 911 and ask for an ambulance because that person needs medical attention. So I will say if somebody has done some cutting behaviors, um, they're not actively bleeding, that's not something that needs immediate attention. You know, we're talking about overdoses here. We're talking about someone who um, potentially attempted to asphyxiate themselves, things of that nature where you know there could be long-term medical consequences as opposed to surface injuries. And another huge thing is following through. You want to follow through. If you are the individual that this person has felt safe enough to talk to, this person has felt safe enough to share with you what's going on, once you're outside of that crisis situation, you want to be checking in with that individual. How are you doing? Send them something from Amazon that costs two bucks. You know, Just do little things to let them know, hey, I'm caring about you. I'm still here. I want to know how things are. How are you following through on the stuff that we talked about? Stay engaged. As I said earlier, it is such a huge vulnerable step and such a step that shows really profound trust if an individual has been willing to talk to you about their own suicidal thinking. So continue to be a person in their lives that they would feel comfortable sharing that with. You don't want to be the person that disappears after you share something pretty big and scary. So these are some of the crisis planning resources that I really like. 
Um, if you were to text, or sorry, if you were to just search on Google crisis lines, you'll find a very similar graphic to what's over here on the right-hand side of the page. So we've got the National Crisis Text Line. It's the same as the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That's the old number for the Suicide Prevention Line, but it still works, thankfully, because a lot of people have that number, you know, in old resources. So the Trevor Project is for LGBTQIA youth ages 15 to 24, although oftentimes younger youth are reaching out. There's the Trans Lifeline, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Lifeline, and then NAMI. And NAMI is the National Association for the Mentally Ill. I believe they just changed their name, and I apologize. I don't remember what they changed it to, but... This is an organization that is driven by individuals who have mental illness and the family members of individuals with mental illness. They have incredible support groups. They have incredible activities that they do within the community. Um, so for individuals who are struggling with psychiatric symptoms, this can be a really great way to become connected with individuals in the community. In terms of crisis planning, so I am going to be doing at some point coming up, hopefully this summer, I'm gonna be doing a second training or a second talk um, here for the ICA on how to talk with individuals when you yourself are experiencing suicidal ideation. Um, there's so much information as you can see here that I just, it would have been irresponsible to try to cram it into this talk. So we're gonna do another talk about that. Um, but here, these crisis planning resources, I think are really excellent for everyone to use. People who are experiencing suicidal ideation, um, sit down with your friend and do it with your friend who's hurting. And there are three different options here. So the Think Ahead Mental Health Crisis Plan, that's from Mental Health America. It's really easy to find online. It is a two-page PDF. And it gives you things to fill out in terms of here are people that I can call, here are things that help, here's something that I want to do if I'm feeling this way. So it's this real proactive way to plan for crisis. Um, and also if someone's in crisis, how to plan, how are you going to manage this crisis? Um, developing your self-care plan, that's through the social work school at the University of Buffalo. It's a more comprehensive document. Um, it's got a lot of different things in it, but it's very user-friendly and um, also something that I, I really like. But then we've got what are called TMAPs, Transformative Mutual Aid Practices Workbook. This is a big workbook, okay? There's a lot in here. Um, but it was designed by individuals with mental illness. So it's very, very much um, based in we are consumers and the, we are having these experiences. And so this is what would work for us. It is probably 50 pages long. Um, and these are all pages that you can fill out. And it can be something that can be very, very helpful because remember I was talking about coping mechanisms are a distraction. We need that distraction a really good distraction is I'm gonna go grab my crisis plan and I'm gonna take a look at this. Just that act itself is a really good distraction. So I'm a big fan of these. And then these are different websites, different things that you can look at. So suicide prevention, um, there's helpguide.org. They have a lot of good information. The CDC, Centers for Disease Control, they have a lot of stuff on suicide prevention as well. This link has risk and protective factors. So looking at exploring things that an individual might have in their life and can or could add to their life to kind of protect against suicidal risk. So that can be things like community building would be an example. What I wish my loved ones understood about being suicidal. It's a nice article I like. Six things I wish others understood about passive suicidal thoughts. Mental health first aid. That's that mentalhealthfirstaid.org group. That's a really strong group. American Association of Suicidology. So this is the group that collects all the research on suicide and they've got a ton of excellent resources available. Um, and then there's the QPR Institute. This is question, persuade and refer. It's another risk model um, to think about how to work with people. It's used at a ton of higher ed organizations. So both of the colleges that I work at use this approach. Um, they have a free no, I'm sorry, it's not free. It's $30. <laughs> they have a $30 online training that you can take. Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily stellar, um, but it's something to check out because different things resonate with us differently. And so other people might find it really helpful. And then lastly, these are the references for the um, statistics that I gave you earlier at the beginning in terms of the levels of chronic pain. So I'm going to 
exit out of this so you can there we go there's my face again well thank you all thank you all for listening i'm a talker um but thank you all so much for being here i really appreciate it thank you so much christy yeah. um, we we are um ready to start taking some questions if anyone would like to ask or send us some in the chat i know that we received a couple comments um a couple comments that I might start yeah. with. Um, so one person just said that um, having pain medication decreases thoughts of suicide for me. That wanted... that makes sense. Absolutely. So if you've got a medication that's able to control some of your suffering, absolutely can understand. So it really becomes the risk factor when somebody wants to end their life and they're intending to overdose with medications. That's when it's like, okay, this is a problem, but oh yeah, very understandable for somebody with a chronic pain issue. That medication is a lifeline oftentimes, not just decreases risk, but it can be a lifeline. Um, we also had another comment um, that was direct message it, messaged that said, um, I hear too often that police can be violent towards people with mental health issues, mm -hmm. especially to minorities. Not a mm -hmm. question, but just a comment. No, and I 100% agree, 100% agree. That's why I said it's such a sticky situation in terms of, you know, making that call, making the call to police and why I would say that really the one time that I would go to immediately calling the police is if someone has a firearm. That's the one time. And, and, and not just they have a firearm in the home. If someone has a firearm out you know, if they've got a firearm out, they are intending to shoot themselves. They are saying to you, I can't keep going. I can't keep doing this. I've got this gun. I, I just can't. And they're not responding to anything that you're saying. They won't set it down. They won't walk away. That's when you call 911. Because you're absolutely right, especially, um, well, just for individuals with mental illness, there's a lot of baggage with police. And then when you talk about minorities and then add in mental illness, you've got a lot of intersectionality and situations can become very dangerous. So that's, that's, it's, it's really reserved for those moments where this person might die if I don't call this very, very severe. Um, if an individual has a firearm in the house, they don't have it out, call a crisis line, ask them what to do. Talk with somebody at that level of care. Try to get that person to go with you to an emergency department, that, that kind of approach. But it's, if a person has a firearm, they're going to use it. It's, you got to call the cops. But I absolutely understand your fear and share that same fear. It's a scary thing. Yeah. Um, another person is just asking if they can get access to the slides. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to be sharing those after, if we're going to share some of them. So they were just interested in that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm more than happy to share slides. I don't know how that can be done. I'm happy to email them to people. If you want to give me your email address, I can send them to you directly. And we absolutely can send them along. We just wanted oh, okay. we just wanted to make sure um oh, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. was that was an option. Very good. Yeah. And okay, then, so you can do that, Jenny. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um and any more questions? We have um lots of oh, we do. Mindy, go ahead. Yeah, I didn't bother to type it. Um it's okay. I'm just Hi. wondering if you're talking to someone um and if you have had suicidal ideation before in your life. Um I, I've already like I, when I was a teenager, I volunteered for a crisis line for youth. Um, so I I know that you wouldn't want to be like, well, I felt the same way and I did, you know, but how do you, um, you know, bring that in as a like, well, I have felt like this before too. And, you know, you're not, you're not the only one who's ever felt like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think pretty much saying exactly what you just said in terms of saying to an individual, I can't claim to understand exactly how you're feeling right now because your experience is unique. It's singular to you. I hear that you're in so much pain and it makes me think back to a time in my life where I had similar feelings and I know how scary and lost and dark that was. And, and thank you so much for being a person who comes to me in this moment because I know, I remember how I felt. So just paralleling again, like you want to include your experience and their experience. Does that make sense? You're like moving in between. So I, I can't fully understand what's going on for you right now, but I have been in a similar situation. And yes. I know how it felt. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just had another question pop into yeah. my mind. I don't know who, if you would answer this or somebody with the ICA uh, group, um, do you know, are there like more active studies on IC and suicide risk or like, has anyone ever looked into the number of suicides with people with IC? Um, I, I was really excited to hear that there have been some studies because I, you know, I, I kind of thought, oh, I'll never find information on the number of people with interstitial cystitis who did commit suicide, you know, stuff like that. But are there more things like that going on? You know, in terms of the literature that I looked at, the the 2021 in Canada was the most IC specific. So, and it wasn't, there's not any information about completed suicides. That was risk of suicide and suicidal ideation. Um, but if you do search IC pain, suicidal ideation, there is more conversation um, just in terms of chronic pain in general and risk, and sometimes a nod to IC. I don't know the literature as well as maybe Jen Lean or Nikki, though. I definitely don't know the literature as well as they do. Do you know of anything? I would have to get back to you on that question. Um, I'd have to ask some of my colleagues. I don't I don't mm -hmm. have that right now. I want to say um, I'm looking at something. Sorry, on my computer really quickly. Um, there is an individual who just published a dissertation which is, um, you can find it, it's called Understanding the Lived Experiences of Women with Interstitial Cystitis. Wow. Sorry, I always trip over that word. Um, that is written by someone in Ottawa, Canada. So this was, this just came out. So I think it's somebody's master's thesis as opposed to a dissertation. But given it's written so recently, I would look at the references that are included in that and see who are they citing? What what literature are they pulling from? Because they will have done a comprehensive search. That's great, thank you. Yeah, and you could do the same thing with the piece that was written in 2021. Um, so that piece is called um, Biopsychosocial Predictors of Suicide Risk in Patients with Interstitial, interstitial Cystitis Bladder, bladder Pain Syndrome. Blah, blah, blah. I assume that'll be in the slides. I don't think yes, I can write all is. that down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, if you, but if you, when you look at the slides, go to that article and then look at their reference section and see who they're citing. That's the way that I always look to find like what is actually out there about this specific topic. Okay, That's thank you. Amazing yeah, advice. Yeah. yeah. Um, my colleague messaged me and said she wasn't aware of any studies, but I think obviously, Christy, what you just shared is is great. Um, someone else in the chat um, asked, is it helpful to encourage the use of take as needed psych meds like lorazepam or Seroquel to get a person at risk temporarily out of a suicidal headspace? Um, I would say, so if this is an individual who has these meds and uses them already as take as needed, that would be something that I would say, okay, if this is a resource that you already have, this is a resource that you can be using, of course. So, you know, if someone um, might, you know, if somebody has panic disorder and they've got some kind of benzodiazepine on hand, okay, that's something you already use. Um, if it is someone who does not consistently use that medication, if it's somebody who might potentially abuse those medications or might take too much, that's when you want to kind of stay away from those things. But if it is already, for lack of a better term, if it's already a coping strategy that they have, if it's already a coping mechanism, then yes. Have you done what works for you? And if lorazepam helps, have you taken that? Um, if this is someone, though, I would say if it's somebody who's at a high risk, you know, if this is someone who's really planning to end their own life, keep them away from benzos and Seroquel. Those are two medications that are going to hurt them. So if they're, if they're planning and they have intent, you don't want to be telling them to go grab medications. That's just not, not something you want to do. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any more questions anybody wants to ask or wants to put in the chat? I think we, I think we got to all of them. Okay. And I don't see any more. 
Okay. Well, thank you again so much, everyone. And thank you for your questions. I really appreciate it. Um, and I hope to hopefully see you again when I do this in, in a couple of months in terms of how do we talk with people when we're having these thoughts and feelings. Um, Cause that's another thing that's never really talked about. Well, thank you so much for yeah. being here with us today, Christy. Yeah. Today's session was very informative. Um, and if you found this webinar to be of value, please consider joining us for future webinars and share these opportunities with your community. Um, mark your calendar for May 9th for our next webinar titled Taking Control, an ICBPS Patient's Guide to Healthcare Navigation. Our speakers will be ICA board members Claudia King and Amber Carter. The link to register is in the chat and on the ICA's website. Um, one quick announcement, we just wanted to let everyone know that um, the ICA is turning 40 this year. Um, and we want you to um, keep your eye in your inbox for ICA emails, follow us on social media, and participate in our 40th anniversary activities. So thank you so much for joining us today. Have a good day, everyone.